Good evening and welcome to Town Meeting Television's continuing coverage of Election 2022. November 8th is Election Day and of course you have the opportunity to vote between now and then. You don't have to wait till Election Day. You can send in your ballots. So hopefully you have not yet made up your mind or maybe you have about this particular district, Chittenden 24, which is Essex. It's the Essex district, right? Essex, yes. Exactly. And so we have two candidates. We have an incumbent, Alyssa Black, who's a Democrat, and Roger Drury, who is a Republican, and we welcome you both. And we let people know that you can give us a call at 862-3966 if you have any questions for the candidates. We're very happy to hear them, but we've also prepared some, which we have provided in advance. So we're gonna start with you, Alyssa, just to start. Tell us why you're running for the state legislature and what qualifies you. Well, hello, good evening. Thank you for having us in today. Um, I'm Representative Alyssa Black. I am currently serving my first term as a legislator. Um, it would just be an absolute honor for me to be able to continue into the next biennium. Uh, during the past two years, um, I've advocated and I have voted in support of key economic recovery efforts for our state and taken action and voted to ensure that we have a Vermont that works for all of us. Um, if elected again, I plan on continuing to build on the foundation that I have created, continuing to listen, develop, continue to develop relationships within the State House um, and represent the values of our community. Um, there's a number of really key critical issues that are on the horizon coming up. Um, issues such as climate action, uh, gun violence prevention, housing, access to affordable health care and affordable child care, um, and of course, reproductive liberty, and that's just naming a few. Um, I think our community will really benefit from having a steady, now experienced and thoughtful leader and someone who shares their values to represent them. That's why I'm running again for re-election. Thank you, Alyssa Black. Thank you. Roger Drury, tell us why you're running and what qualifies you for the position of state representative. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for having us today. Uh, well, my name is Roger Drury. I'm, uh, I'm a father of three boys, uh, all in elementary, middle, and high school. I'm a 36-year veteran of the Vermont Army National Guard. I have uh, activated three times, one in Homeland Defense right after the 9-11 uh, attacks. The second was uh, in Af Afghanistan as an embedded trainer. Uh, training the Afghan National Army. And the third was as a medevac uh, company commander, helicopter commander in Iraq. So I've had uh, some experiences with uh, multinational work uh, and of course, uh, homeland security work. I, um, I offer my experiences in collaborative leadership for the, for the voters of Essex and uh, for, for this November. I don't have all the answers but I do promise to listen to multiple points of view before casting any, any votes if elected. And do you have any particular issues that are driving you to the legislature? There's nothing really particularly driving me to the legislature. I felt it was a, uh, just the next step in my, in my career of public service. Okay, awesome. Well, let's start with the next question, which would begin with you, and that's about education. The legislature can make impacts on how education is funded statewide. I don't think we've ever stopped talking about how education is funding. And so do you see a need to change the formulas, how we do it? And how would you use the office to move that education financing agenda forward? Well, I think most Vermonters will concur that our, our current tax model is, uh, it's pretty difficult to follow. And I am still learning a lot, a lot of the ins and outs uh, about it. So I'm, I'm intrigued about a concept of moving to more of a income-based solution, but I would want to learn more how it would affect the second and third order effects on, on Vermonters, on, uh, on the agricultural, uh, you know, on farmers, as well as uh, folks who live more in the towns. I, um, no matter where or how we choose a tax model for, uh, for the future, I, I would like to see the legislature leverage a little bit more on alleviating some of the administrative burdens that I, that I feel are on our schools and help them reduce costs that way. All right, thank you very much. Alyssa, tell us your, your 
approach to education financing and how you'd move it forward? Well, first of all, I believe that, you know, fundamentally we have a collective responsibility for ensuring equitable outcomes for all of our students. And moving forward on some of the work that we did in the legislature this year, um, last session we updated the weights, um, including significantly higher weights for multilingual and students and those that are living in poverty. The weights are, um, you know, they acknowledge that there are certain students who are more expensive to educate. Um, and Is that pupil waiting? Not pupil, it's pupil waiting, yes. Um, and I think that in the upcoming biennium, we're going to have to work on um, tweaking, refining all of the progress that we made last year. Um, I think it's just really important that we are creating our next generation to become productive and successful members of our community. It benefits every single one of us. Um, so we've created in Vermont a system of funding education that is actually really tax progressive. However, <laughs> it's also really confusing and people don't understand it. I did a three-day webinar just to be able to understand the basics of how our system of education is funded. Um, I am in favor of simplifying it. Um, and in, we ha had several studies that were put in in this year and they'll be coming out soon. One of those is um, looking at income-based financing rather than property tax-based financing of our education system. I'm really looking forward and interested in seeing that one come out. Um, you know, I also know and I trust that our committees on education and ways and means are going to be doing, looking at this very hard and doing their due diligence on it. And I look forward to the possibility of possibly moving towards that type of financing system. Thank you. Well, let's move on to the healthcare question because again, healthcare is the largest um, budget item that we have in the state in many respects, and whether it's our personal budgets or the state's budget. And I wonder what you would like to pursue in terms of alleviating the cost of health care for Vermonters. Well, I could probably spend the whole 30 minutes on this topic. Um, can I do a real quick PSA um, as we're getting ready to go into open enrollment here? Um, there are much higher income qualifications currently in order to be eligible for tax subsidies and help pay for premiums. If in the past you have not qualified for these tax premiums, please, please reach out to Vermont Health Connect. Um, because most likely if you weren't in the past, you are now. So PSA over. Um, so I wanted to talk about health inequities a little bit. Um, during 2021, um, we established a health equity advisory commission and one of their charges is to provide guidance um, coming up in the next year for our newly created Office of Health Equity. Um, the commission is, has been meeting and continuing to meet and next session we will be working on moving forward with their recommendations. Um, we also have renewed partnerships with the federal government, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, this is federal money that we are going to be able to use to provide um, more resources to Vermonters. Um, I mean, including, you know, we are receiving funding for wraparound services um, that are connected to housing, you know, keep people in stable housing. Um, you know, I sit on house health care. Um, my overarching goal when I sit in that committee room and I listen to testimony, um, I'm constantly asking myself, is this equitable? Are we providing the right care at the right cost in the right place and the right setting in the right time? And, um, you know, we talk a lot about what our values are and we say, and we talk about what services and types of care that we value. And I'm always questioning, are we prioritizing these things in our budgets? Um, you know, if we say we value primary care or mental health care, where are they in our budgets? 
Thank you very much. Roger Drury, why don't you tell us your approach to addressing the inequities in health care and the financing model for the state? Well, as far as the financing component goes, I, I don't have a lot of experience in how the state is funding their, their health care. I do have, uh, I have spoken with some, some experts in the field. I can't tell you that I can pare it back everything that they have told me. But one of our, our biggest challenges is the individual accepting ownership for their own health care. And I'm not talking about paying for it. And I understand we've got some, some solid programs that can, that can truly help people. What I'm talking about is uh, heart disease, diabetes, uh, those types of self-inflicted, and I understand that some of it can be hereditary, but we are eating ourselves to death in this nation. And we need to be able to provide some sort of incentive, and whether it's gym memberships or whether it's uh, just making sure that when someone goes to the doctor that they are truly following their doctor's advice. Uh, those are the what I see and what I hear are truly driving up health care costs, not taking care of people. We're going to take care of people, but we've got to help folks take some ownership in their own health. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to just remind people you can give us a call at 862-3966. That's 862-3966. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions for the candidates for state rep from Essex. Criminal justice reform, next question for you, Roger. How does Chittenden County address crime in your view? Do you think there's a problem with policing that needs to be reformed? And another very big question, how would you address community safety? I believe we've created uh, several no-win situations between crime and, and law enforcement right now with our prison situation. I believe we have well-trained police. I believe they're hardworking and understaffed. And there's several reasons for that. Our politicians have created a situation where citizens do not trust the police. And there are some understandably reasons why, but at the same token, putting up rhetoric, calling our police names, defunding them is not the right and proper way to address some of the problems that we're having. I support, uh, excuse me, I, well, I support our police, but we need to create a situation where criminals understand that there are repercussions for their actions. And I don't feel that in Chittenden County we truly have those repercussions. Now that being said, I fully support restorative justice. I think it's an important component in law enforcement as well as uh, paying back to the community. That being said, we still need to trust our police and keep them well resourced. All right, thank you very much. Lisa, your response to the question about community safety and police reform. Yeah, so this is one of those questions you get and you think, oh goodness. Um, so one thing you learn immediately when you enter the legislature is you can't be an expert on everything. Um, I am not an expert on this, <laughs> but I am really, really fortunate that I serve with four other absolutely remarkable women as part of our Essex delegation and we rely on each other a great deal um, to be able to represent all of the constituents in our community and utilizing the strengths of each of us. Um, on this issue, I rely on Representative Karen Dolan. This is her issue. She guides me on this. I trust her on this. Um, you know, in Chittenden County, I think we're very fortunate. Every county is different. Um, but we have a really large toolbox in to address crime, uh, restorative justice, like you mentioned. We have drug courts, you know, the traditional sentencing, court diversion, probation. Um, having all of these tools are really essential um, because crime is a really complicated issue. Uh, the overwhelming majority of crime is nonviolent, and it's really rooted in you know, the gaps of care that we have in our communities. Poverty, mental health, just inequitable system access. Um, we need to address crime and community safety by filling those gaps and creating a more equitable system of justice. Thank you very much. 
All right, our next question has to do with the ballot issues, ballot questions. One is Proposition 2 and the other is Proposition 5. What's your position on those two? And maybe you could shed some light on what they are just as a matter of public <laughs> education. So I fully support both these constitutional amendments. Um, Proposition 5 um, will enshrine reproductive autonomy health care in our Constitution. Um, Proposition 2 um, clarifies, removes some ambiguous language that's currently in our Constitution around slavery. Um, so I, I will tell you, I remember the day that I voted on Prop 5. I remember waking up in the morning and just sitting with my coffee and this, you know, the enormous weight and responsibility of my vote on this. And what an honor it was to cast that yes vote. I just kept thinking forevermore that House Journal is going to say, Representative Alyssa Black of Essex votes yes. Um, it was this enormous feeling of pride and I wish that every single voter that walks into that voting booth or fills out your ballot at your table is able to sense the same amount of pride that I was able to feel when I made that vote on the House floor. Um, enshrining reproductive liberty and the removal of this ambiguous language and clarifying um, slavery related language from our Constitution is absolutely essential and I encourage everyone to vote yes on both these constitutional amendments. Thank you very much. Roger Drury, your positions on Proposition 2 and Proposition 5. Well, my position truly relies on, on the Vermonters. The vote will be in the Vermonters' hands. It won't be truly in Roger Drury's hands. Uh, that being said, I've done a little bit of analysis on it and as far as uh, Prop 2, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think it does remove some ambiguous language. I've read a few essays on it, and I, at first I won't pull any punches. I was very concerned that it would affect our restorative justice pro programs where it wouldn't allow for community service. Some of the essays have come back and said that won't be the case because it's a mutual agreement, so I, I can get fully behind Prop 2 and, and remove that ambiguous language. Prop 5. I disagree with it wholeheartedly. I'm concerned that an amendment that is designed to protect abortion does not include the word abortion in it at all and it enshrines itself in reproductive liberty. It's not defined. It's leaving it up to the courts to define and the legislature I feel did a punt where they could have simply said we want to enshrine abortion and the legislature will make no laws restricting abortion. They didn't do that. They chose the language very specifically so it would go to the courts. I don't know where that would come out of, but I don't think that that's something the courts should be handling. Personally, I am a pro-choice Republican, but I am against Prop 5. All right. May I respond just a little bit? Sure. I just want to clarify something. It is really important for people to understand um, you know, the language of Proposition 5 or Article 22, um, these rights are already in statute. What changing, what adding Article 22 to our Constitution does is it takes it out of the hands of future fickle legislators to remove and do strike calls from our statute. That is why we are putting it in our Constitution. It changes nothing from what current law is. It just makes it so that current law cannot be changed. So can you just clarify? Without going through another constitutional amendment. <laughs> yeah, so the, the proposition doesn't mention abortion. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why that is? It removes the government from the decision making around reproductive health. It is a decision between a family, a woman, her husband, her partner. 
it is a decision between healthcare providers and that person. It removes it from governors and legislators and courts or anything else. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. Do you have a follow up? Yeah. Just the last line in the proposition says, unless otherwise deemed by the state. So the state is retaining the ability to make changes as it see fits for the, for the fickle for the fickle legislators. I trust the people of Vermont to continue to vote in legislators to uphold their values. I don't believe we need to add this ambiguous language in it. All right, let's move on to the next question, shall we? Language access. What is the value to Vermonters in supporting language access to information about health, local government, and education issues? Roger. I think it's an incredible benefit to make sure that new Vermonters can have access to, to services. So I would, I would support it in, in many ways as feasible and reasonable. Uh, you were telling me just before the interview some of the ways that you guys are, are taking care of it. I think that's absolutely wonderful. I do think it's equally important though that we provide English as a second language for those who would like to, like to take it. Uh, my ex experiences in Afghanistan were, were kind of uh, unique and fun where we would have, we would work through interpreters and our interpreters had every good intention to tran translate as best they could. But as Americans, we sometimes would use some idiomatic expressions that just did not translate well. And there is a, there is a benefit to being able to, to speak the local language. Then that's, that's not a dig. I just want to encourage and figure out ways that we can allow that to happen. So you mentioned that you're translating into 16 different languages. I barely speak English. I'm going to have a hard time speaking with, with Vermonters or Essex constituents who can speak, you know, another language than myself. But if they have the ability that we can at least communicate somewhat and through Google Translate or any other uh, options, I, I would love to see that happen. All right, thank you, Roger. Melissa, <laughs> your view on this question. Uh, so language access benefits absolutely everyone. And I have learned over the last two years. Um, so at the beginning of the COVID outbreak um, in multi, lingual communities, the health flyers, press releases, press conferences, they were only in English. Um, I mean, there were entire families that lost their income. Our health department and our hospital resources were incredibly impacted by this and stretched um, because there were entire communities that weren't receiving the information. Um, people got sick, people died because of this. Um, I personally worked on a bill in 2021 to expand access to Dr. Dinosaur for pregnant women and children, uh, regardless of their immigration status. We allocated money for coverage in the first year for that. The problem is it wasn't utilized because there was no strategy to be able to communicate it to the affected populations. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were women who could have had coverage for their prenatal care, and they didn't get it. Um, and it's not just languages. Um, this year, the healthcare committee did a bill on expanding coverage uh, for hearing aids. While we're taking testimony, we realized that the deaf and hard of hearing, the very community that we were trying to help, they couldn't be at the table based on the current setup we had for communication. Uh, we thought we were being accessible by being on YouTube, but if you can't hear us, that's not accessible. Um, we ended up bringing in sign language interpreters. That was, that was actually a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, I mean, when everyone has equal participation in our government, our schools, uh, the healthcare system, it absolutely benefits everyone if we can ensure that every voice has a seat at our tables. Thank you very much. We're gonna to go to um, the lightning round. So, Alyssa, why don't you tell us um, what your top priorities are for the next biennium? You have 30 seconds. Uh, so if reelected, my 
top two priorities that I personally am going to be working on are gun violence prevention and suicide prevention. Um, I actually am already, already working on these things um, in anticipation and hopes that I'm reelected. Very good. Thank you. Roger, how about you? If uh, the Speaker of the House provides me the opportunity, I would love to work on encouraging emerging, emerging technologies into Vermont. Uh, our citizens truly care about the environment and I would love to capitalize on that to see how we can do anything from hydrogen generation to some of the, uh, the high temperature salt storage for, uh, for, for energy. Uh, I'd also like to see us uh, working more on encouraging more, more housing development. Uh, the median income in Essex is 77000 You know, if you use Dave Ramsey's model of 30% expenses for housing and taxes, we're looking at uh, mortgages of about 275000 There's not few, there's not houses that are 275000 in Essex. We need to figure out ways to reduce those costs and get those houses built. All right, thank you. So let me ask you this on COVID-19. What are your top takeaways? on uh, what you saw enacted during the pandemic, either improvements or things that you learned that you think should be brought forward into policy? I think we witnessed an incredible state response in, uh, in getting multiple resources to bear from the food support to the financial support to just the, the, the messaging. I think, I think our state did a very good job. Uh, I got to put a plug in for the Vermont Army National Guard and the Vermont Air National Guard for the efforts that they did for immediate action response and for building that, uh, that secondary hospital over at the fairgrounds. The, uh, that being said, I, I also know or believe that truth has a date time group. And as we, as we learned, and we, as we learn more about this disease, I think that we could have done a little bit more to open our economy and our school system sooner, but that's using hindsight. All right, thank you very much. Elisa Black, your learning takeaway from oh, COVID. Oh, well, my, my biggest thing was the benefits of telehealth. Um, for healthcare access, mental healthcare access. That has been incredible. Um, also, you know, the need, what we just talked about, the need for language access, and that we've also had this incredible transparency in governing um, with Zoom access. Um, I mean, I am on YouTube every single day when I sit in committee and that will be there forever and ever and ever <laughs> for anyone to watch at any time that they want. <laughs> it will be, if they archive it properly, that's true. Yes. Um, quickly, we'll have one more of these. Opiates and addiction, do you support safe injection sites in Vermont, in Chittenden County? Yes, absolutely I do. I support anything that will lead to less deaths. All right, Roger, how about you? I do not. Nations and other states that have tried this are, are pulling back on it. It's a failed model. Okay. So why don't we um, go to closing statements? Oh. Yeah. Okay. I know. We have two minutes left. Wow. So, Roger, we're going to start with you, if you don't mind. Roger Drury, Republican candidate for state representative in Chittenden 24. Well, I'd, I'd really like, like to thank you and the rest of the Channel 17 staff for, for having us over here today. Uh, this has been an incredible opportunity. I thank Alyssa for, for her time. Uh, we're not going to agree on every issue. Uh, there are multiple issues and lots to learn that are about this, uh, the whole processes. But I do promise that I will always listen and take multiple points of view into account before making any decisions. Looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you so much. Alyssa Black, your closing comments. Yeah, and also I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to allow us to come in and Roger for being here. It's always great talking with you. Um, you know, it has been my greatest honor to serve as a representative. I mean, frankly, it is one of the most important things that I've ever done in my life. And I hope to be able to continue to represent our community, our values in Montpelier. Um, I'm humbly asking for your vote on November 8th or beforehand with your mail-in ballot. And I want to really be able to continue the work that I feel like I'm just getting started on. Wonderful. I want to thank you both for joining us. This has been very interesting. I love doing these forums and I appreciate <laughs> that you're both here tonight. Elizabeth Black is a Democrat and she's an incumbent and she is running for re-election. Roger Drury is a Republican and he is the challenger. And we are talking about today the District 24. It's hard to imagine that there's so many districts in Chittenden County, but there are. And we are also wanting to encourage you to be sure to vote 
on or before November 8th, and of course to tune in to Town Meeting TV's continuing coverage of all the candidates in Chittenden County, and also election night results on November 8th starting at 7.30. So thanks for watching, have a great evening.